Good morning, world. I am here with my wonderful friend, Rosine Abergel Ferber. She is a Parisian born painter with Egyptian parents, and she has transformed this beautiful Silicon Valley art shack into the most beautiful place. And I want you to talk, I want you to hear what she has to say because she's amazing. So I'm starting you here with the newest piece. I just finished it last week. It's very uh, untypical of my work. Very, very quiet. My work has a lot of color, but I just switched it up because I felt like that would just, um, there was something like peaceful about this piece. And what my philosophy about art is very process oriented. So I'm never thinking of the end pro pro product. Mm. I never, I'm not product oriented. So I will just play, play, play. I mean, this is the whole thing. And keep all the judgment. You know that little judgment, that little judge that come creeping in your head, <laughs> telling you you're screwing up and you're not doing this right. Well, I leave that one at the door. And I, I just play. This is, I feel like I didn't play enough when I was a little girl. And I feel mm. like my whole life I have been playing and I've been playing with colors and with art. This, this one I did in uh, 2018. And it's just, I love grids. There's something about grids that like keep me grounded. I feel like I can just hang things on grids, just the balance to it. But in within it, it's always about, you know, a lot of, you know, fun stuff and stamps, mixed media, resin, you know, all sorts, images, photos that I take, uh, letters. I mean, it's like a big mishmash. And it's like trying to piece together little disparate pieces and bring them into an aesthetic whole, something that will you know, that look like it all belongs together, that it, that it, and gives you the feel of, um, I just love this narrative. I have a very multicultural background. As uh, you have said, uh, my parents come from Egypt and I was born and raised in France. And uh, I had a lot, there are lots of pieces, languages, uh, you know, things in my life. And I feel like I'm forever piecing together little pieces into holes. I just feel like that's, that's a recurring pattern. So Rosine, tell me how you started painting. How I started painting. Um, I'm, um, I didn't start painting until probably like the 70s or 80s, but um, I painted a little bit here and there. I was always kind of creative. I love to knit, I love to sew, but I didn't paint that much uh, until I became an art therapist. So I studied at Notre Dame de Namur, and in every class we had to uh, we had to do a little bit of art in every single class to see to actually experience how uh, this was going to be, f f you know, how clients would experience that. So we had to actually do it ourselves. And then I feel like there was an explosion of creativity when that happened. Um, and I started painting more and more and then I transformed a part of my house. I had a little room that I transformed into an art studio and then progressively, you know, it's kind of a developmental process. So progressively then decided I need to be more serious about it. So then rented a place outside my home and finally ended up here because I felt like I needed a place uh, where I could just have my own vision and um, work, you know, work here and develop myself as an artist. So. And I am so amazed at how you've transformed this place. So I'd love to know how you did that. You mentioned a few things about that that are amazing. I was in a big warehouse with about 15 other th artists. Mm -hmm. And that was wonderful. I love being, you know, with other artists. And I am right now sharing some space uh, at a gallery in Palo Alto. So I love that part. But I felt really strongly that I needed to have my own 
space. So I started looking around and I found this place and it was a wreck. I mean, it was really, really in very bad shape. It was like water was seeping, it was all, everything was, the walls were rotted. I mean, there were dead rats in the, I mean, it was just pretty awful and termites everywhere. I mean, I had to tent it. So anyway, I got just the right people to help me. I had a vision uh, that it could be something more. Like one of the first thing I saw is that it has a high ceiling. I'm like, oh, a high ceiling, okay. And it has it had some windows, and I felt like if we could remove all of these uh, walls that were there and things that were not necessary, that I could create one big nice space, paint everything up, but not give up the soul of the place. So I wanted to keep the floor intact, the ceiling intact, and like the supportive, uh, you know, uh, structure intact and we'll show you around a little bit uh, so that it doesn't lose its soul. I wanted to, you know, to be obvious that I love these juxtaposed opposites, you know, the beauty, but also the harsh metal and the floor, the raw floor and all of this together is so exciting. And um, these opposites that you piece together, right? This very rough floor, this like metal, uh, you know, pole here in the middle. And then, you know, all of the softness of, I love doing textiles, so you'll see this textile here. There's a lot of color, there's a lot of heart here. It's just a warm and fuzzy in many ways, but also has that harsh and um, kind of coarse uh, quality to it. So I was able to see something beyond what was in front of me. That, that was the key. I think this has been one of the most creative things I've ever done in my life, to really be able to see something that looks like hell. But you know <laughs> that there's something behind there that you can, and you're taking a big chance that you know the whole thing could be real bad. But I had faith and I really needed a really good place. And so I had a lot of good intention and I was willing to work hard at it. And I also got some very good people to help me. And we were able to transform this into a really creative and lovely space. And, um, but every day I am reminded of how it was when I first got it. So, uh, because some elements I have retained, you know, I have kept intact. So Rosine, I am so fascinated by the uh, the psychotherapy aspect and how you work that with the art therapy. Tell us about that. So um, I am a marriage and family therapist, licensed marriage and family therapist and an uh, art therapist. And I have worked, uh, while I was doing my own art part-time, I was also working uh, and supervising interns. Um, you probably know they if you go into this field you have thousands of hours that need to be supervised by a uh, registered cer board certified uh, therapist so i did this for years at a local mental health agency and um and that was wonderful i mean i also worked with families and and all of that uh, and so when I opened the art check, I wanted to continue that work. And I have a great big table, we'll show it to you it's here in the center. Um, and um, I, before COVID, I mean, things quieted down a little bit during COVID, but before COVID, I had groups of psychotherapists, art therapists who need to have their hours supervised, but also psychotherapists who wanted to learn how to integrate creative expression into their uh, work. Uh, that is how to help people express when there are no words, um, how to help them express in other ways. Because I think it's really hard if you, all you have and if all you depend on is words. So images can be very powerful and they help to externalize what is going on. And so I have had uh, many groups here. I've had workshops, but also many groups of therapists um, who uh, need supervision. So we have, these, we have these four hour groups where we talk about cases and also 
take care of the therapist by actually creating. So all the therapists are actually painting and collaging and playing with materials while they're talking about cases and clients and difficult things uh, that they're going through and managing. So, uh, this is so this is also not only helping the client, but also helping the therapist. When I was putting the art track together, I was uh, in Half Moon Bay and I was in this little antique shop and I found this mattress uh, <laughs> spring. And I thought, oh, that is going to be perfect. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But I decided that I would put, so this is a lot of the textile play, mm -hmm. uh, pieces of textiles, uh, felting, uh, knitting, uh, all kinds of this. Ooh. This I actually had put on the tree. I knitted a coat for the tree, and then it fell apart, but I didn't want to throw it out. So it's like, it, you know, I washed it, but it's, you know, and then um, you see this. This is my knitting. I love to knit. So I love textile. This is my little uh, foray into jewelry making. I just, uh, you know, uh, play with that. And then this is weaving, you know, a little bit of weaving these fabric, these uh, textiles. Nice. These. So a lot of play here. Yes, please. please Knitting. Please. Nice. And then here is like one of the pieces also, I finished this one during COVID. I was doing a lot of work on my own in COVID, during COVID. And these are just piecing together fabrics and then pieces, parts of like little quilted uh, textiles that I do. These are fabrics that are made from my handwriting that I actually digitally get it made uh get it made as fabric and then these are like transferred images onto fabric and um and these are like pieces from different countries like this is from japan and this is from like a bedouin tri uh, tribe in israel this is also so i'm always looking when i travel for like the work of women what women do and uh, the beautiful embroidery or you know anything that is handmade by women that i can use and integrate into my pieces and then i love to paint so i just uh, you know take the stuff out onto the grass literally and just you know with a bottle paint and just you know write something it's usually free associations it doesn't have any real you know I don't think consciously about it and then I just sew sew and sew like just embroider very free-handedly you know um without any like I said I love to play so um I don't have an idea of what it's going to be uh, from the beginning, but I know and I have faith that it, I am going to arrive where I need to be. So I really constantly have this dialogue with the piece, like, what do you, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? Oh, I could add a little bit of this, or I could add, a, and this is really, really therapeutic. When you repeat something, you sew it over and over again. Your hand is moving in that. It just drops you into this flow state into this, um, into this uh, state of mind that is very peaceful and zen, you know, when you just keep like that needle going and going. So for hours, I can do this. I see that my husband loves to watch TV, loves to, he loves to watch movies at night, and I feel like it's, I can't just sit there and just do nothing, so this is what I do. I sew and sew and sew and sew. And this piece was very interesting because I was with a friend of mine who is an, a therapist and she, you know, was looking at me and she said, well, both of us were sitting, standing in front of it and she said, you know, it has such a mom feeling. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, I can really, I feel that, you know, and my mom passed away a few years ago. I feel that mom. And then all of a sudden, this is the unconscious miraculous way in which things work so incredibly ea is my mother's initials emily abergel which was like i had never even noticed it 
I had never even, you know, and I was like, so taken aback. But I know this is deep. It's like you're doing this work unconsciously. There's deep, deep meaning in it. And you, you know, when you meditate on it and you write about it, then you might get some incredible little nuggets, uh, gifts from your unconscious like that, you know? So this is the piece. What a transformation. So tell me about how you brought the community together with something you did out front (laughs) that really changed things on this street. So when I first came, as I said, it used to be a landscape business. There were a lot of people living here. It was just really messy. And outside, it's a little, this is a little uh, industrial area, half industrial and half residential. But this little part here is industrial, and there's a little bodega across the street. Um, So this place, you know, literally people would go and buy food, and they would just dump everything on the floor. I mean... It was just curious to me, and I thought, okay, I'm going to rehab this building. I'm going to paint it pretty. I'm going to plant some beautiful plants, and then I'm going to really help clean it up, clean up the outside, because it wasn't sufficient to just, you know, be in my little, and then when I walked out, I just didn't like what I was seeing. So what I did was, this was a strategy, I took the trash can and the little, you know, one of those, like, picker, you know, things that pick up the trash, because I didn't want to you know, pick it up with my hands or even with gloves. So I went outside and I made sure all my neighbors saw me. So three times a week I'd be out there with my, rolled my, my, my can out and start picking up the trash across the street all over. I'd be like on the whole block. Everyone saw me. And I did this religiously three times a week. And lo and behold, this is an amazing thing that happens. It's like people get it by osmosis. When they look at you, they go, maybe I can do something to fix something around me or can. And all of a sudden, people started picking up their trash. It was miraculous. And um, my little neighborhood now is all clean and beautiful. And it's just lovely. Just a little experiment in um, just trying to influence people in positive ways. Because I think people really do want to... Uh, do good things. They want to live in nice, clean places. They want to. Um, they want to do good. I really, essentially, feel like people are truly good and want to do good. And so, when they see someone, they go, "Oh, maybe I can do something." I mean, this is more representative of my work. This is during COVID, where I felt so cooped up that I just wanted to, I took these old canvases that I didn't know what to do with, and it was all about transformation, so I turned it over. This was vertical, you see this? Mm-hmm. Right here, it was, it was uh, horizontal, sorry. Okay. And then I turned it over to oh. a vertical position, oh and I painted right over it. So you see the drips and all this, and this is because it's like another life. It's like turning over that that pre-COVID leaf and just (laughs) pop the colors and just have fun with it, really play and really externalize joy. I was just feeling happy. This is just very recent and um, very relieved that um, things were getting back to normal a little bit more and that I was able to see friends and all that. I don't know, there was like a lot of joy and that was um, in spring, so. I love that. Into this little area, when I was uh, uh, thinking of the art check, I wanted to have the outside be part of the inside, like very zen, where I can open the studio doors and really see uh, outdoors. So I had this little planter uh, made Mm -hmm. here Mm -hmm. and planted all kinds of things. And then, okay, these are some of the things that, uh, so recently, about three years ago, I started doing ceramics. So it's a totem pole. And then here's some more. But yeah, it just like makes it. <laughs> They're just. You remember, because my mom was one of the most creative people that I've ever met. She was an incredible knitter. She sewed, she cooked, she...
So I planted this tree in her honor. It's a milia tree. Her, her name was Emily, but um, her Egyptian first name was Milia. So this is the milia tree. And I thought it should be at the center of this place so I can remember her. And, and these are all my ceramics, you know, things that um, I've made in my classes. Which one? This one? Yeah. Oh, this is one of my fav favorite artists. Beautiful. Yeah, so the, all those pieces, like this and that piece, this is from, um, this is uh, Glashoff uh, metalwork. Wow. I love his work. So Here we go. We're going to go see more art. I am, I'm very prolific. <laughs> so here we are. So a lot more art here. I have all this space for myself. A lot of the work that I've done. <laughs> lots, lots of pieces here. This is one that I just took down. And then I like to integrate you know, mixed media and textiles. Mm -hmm. This is a piece that has both. And let's see. So. This one. Yeah. Tell me about that. Oh, this one is done in 2013. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh, 48 by 60. I, I love doing the little strips of color, you know, like this stuff here. I don't know, this is developed, you know, in my work. And so I have that. And then it's just like playing and, and layering, you know, layers are so, so important in my work. And that's what gives it kind of soul and depth. Um, you know, like there's something underneath, you quite, you don't know quite what it is. And there's a lot of play and doodle and, you know, because as I said, I play a lot and I don't think about what it's going to be. I just follow the process and then there comes a point during the work that, you know, that you just get this, I think it's done. It's done. There's nothing more that I can do here. It's done and it, it just works for me. And so that was it. I don't remember what I named this one, but it is one of my favorite pieces. I love this piece. A little bit of an image here of a, Jap a Japanese lady. Um, some flowers. I always like, I love roses in my work. There's always a little rose. And there are also little girls in my work. There's usually, there's very often a little girl, a witness, you know, some kind of witness, a little girl witness, my inner child or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I love numbers and, you know, all kinds of pieces that elicit, uh, kind of memories and uh, stories. You know, people have stories, the stories of our lives, of our, of everything we do and that we've, our families and all that. And I feel like that's what shows up. There's like lots of story narratives. So, Rosine, I wanted to ask you about aging with attitude because we are, I'm 66, and things are getting better in many ways, and I want to hear what you as a celebrated, wonderful artist has to say about aging. So, aging. Well, I always think that aging is, is a thing in your mind. It's a mental state because I don't feel... I mean, I'm 67 years old, just turned 67, but I don't feel like that is an important piece. What's important is that I'm living fully. I am, I feel like I, I am taking the time now because I've taken care of a lot of people, taking care of three children, raised them, they're all grown. I've taken care of 
clients, I've taken care of interns, I've taken care of, um, you know, I take care of my husband. I, you know, we are caretakers as women. And so finding a place where we, and a time where we can actually individuate and, you know, and find our own little place in the sun where we can f live fully our dreams or whatever it is that we, our passion. And feeling that we deserve it and we're entitled to it and we can do it and we are grateful that we can. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And that this is what I find in my life that I have, um, that I am at, at a precious time in my life where I'm just fully, um, it's almost like I'm using all the colors of my being, you know? It's like I'm painting, but I also have the richness of all the experiences that I've had, of having raised a family, of having worked, of having done all those things. So everything is connected to everything and it informs everything I do today, all the past. So um, I feel like there is a richness of all this that is coming together um, in a really very fulfilling way. And I'm just grateful that I'm just doing, just living this dream thing that I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to paint and do, not always, it developed, but lately, I mean, the last couple of decades um, of developing this dream of doing this thing that I really love and that just feeds my soul. I just think the important thing here is living with no regrets, really living fully. Like, you know, you're not gonna live forever. You, you know, everybody dies, you're gonna die. So that helps you bring it to this moment, you know, which is appreciating and loving this moment and doing what you love and really filling up on it, you know? Because it's not always going to be, we don't know what's in the future and the, pa and the, 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 the past is gone. So it's like, if there's only this moment and what we do now, I always think, you know, when I die, I don't want anybody to be sad. Champagne only, I tell my husband. Champagne for everyone. I've had a great time. I've lived my life, I'm doing what I love to do. I feel grateful about it and no regrets and no sadness. I know it's sad when people die, but it's sadder if you haven't lived your life, mm -hmm. right? So, and if it can't be done on a full canvas, it can be done on a small canvas. You know, that's why I say, oh, and maybe a big canvas is too intimidating. So do it on a small canvas, you know, make it flow. Like creativity is like, you know, like a river. You have to just keep it flowing and, and going and not damming it up. So it's like living your life and enjoying every day and taking each moment. So the garden. Well, you know, I, I see my life as like, all my life I've cultivated this garden, right? I've put a lot of trees and plants in it, but it has little, my garden has little spaces one space in the garden is my husband and I only. One space in the garden is my husband, my children and I. Mm -hmm. So that was all. That was always, you know, there was always a separate garden. Like I'm going out to dinner, kids, you guys stay home and have pizza. Daddy and I are going out. So that's the garden of just my husband and I. But there's a very important garden there that I've cultivated my whole life. And that's my own little plot in the garden that is just only mine. And the art check is a little bit like this. It is a place that is mine. And people come if they're invited, but you know, they don't, I mean, it's, it's just mine. And I've cultivated, and my husband has been very kind of honoring that and letting me have this garden. I think that probably helped our marriage a lot. <laughs> you know, just cultivating your own self, individuating, developing your own self in an autonomous kind of way, but also keeping in balance uh, 
the togetherness part. And this very, I'm thinking of Murray uh, Bowen, who talks about one of the hardest things to manage in life is together, togetherness and separateness. How much separate and how much together. That we're always negotiating this over and over again. And finding this place where you have your own space, your own thing that is just yours, and also be together in relationships, in full relationship with others, doing all of this and being able to balance it. This has been, I think, the challenge, right? I want to give you one of the hearts that I've been making hearts. Oh. So I want to give you one. Thank you. Pick one that you like. Oh, thank you.